All right. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today at our monthly Drug Researchers Roundtable. My name is Sheila Vicaria, and I'm the Deputy Director of our Department of Research and Academic Engagement. And for a quick moment, I'd just like my supervisor, the Managing Director of the Department, Jules Netherland, to wave you to her. Uh, this is Summer, who's our, our intern from uh, the Hunter Silberman School of Social Work, who actually helped us pull this all together. And in the back is my colleague, Eliza Cohen. So uh, we are the Department of Research and Academic Engagement at the Drug Policy Alliance. What we do is we really help the organization to infuse the best available evidence into our policy advocacy work. But another really big important part of our work as a department is to engage uh, academics in conversations with communities that are impacted by their research. And so these kinds of roundtables are an opportunity for us to bring together folks doing research that either touches directly upon drug policy or that is some way a nexus issue to drug policy and to bring them in conversation with communities. And so thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. In case you need to use the restroom at any point, just continue to follow the bookshelves around and around and around and the bathrooms are actually behind you. So just keep going around if you need to, to use the restroom. If you want to use our Wi-Fi, this is our Wi-Fi and our password. And if you are on, are on Twitter, please feel free to tweet about what you're learning today uh, using the hashtag DrugResearchersRT. And our, our actual our presenter also has a Twitter account. Would you mind telling us what that is? It's nzodi. Spelled that way. Yes, so if you'd like to tag Naomi in, in your tweets today, please feel free to do so. So before I get started, I want to tell you about some of the other events that we have coming up that might be of interest to some of you. So first and foremost, we actually have a call for applications for a research incubator that we're hosting um, in, in a few months. It might be of interest to some of you. It's particularly focused on um, increasing research that really focuses on the experiences of people who use drugs who engage with illicit drug markets. And we're really hoping to help facilitate some uh, cutting edge and innovative research on understanding how people engage with drug markets, how people make purchasing decisions, and the ways in which we can work with drug markets to keep people safe. And so if that is anything that might be of interest to you and you might want to submit to join us in this research incubator, please talk to one of the folks that I just mentioned because we'd love to have you be part of that uh, conversation. We also, in just a few weeks on March 12th, will be hosting a, a briefing with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As some of you may already be noticing on the ground, benzodiazepines are playing a growing role in overdose deaths here in New York City and nationally more broadly. And so we're going to actually have representatives from the City Department of Health to talk to us a little bit about overdose trends here in New York City and the involvement of benzodiazepines and to really kind of talk about what that's looking like on the ground and to really talk to through also what that means for harm reduction and for policy um, in the city. And then lastly, we do have our March Drug Researchers Roundtable scheduled for next month and we'd love for you to join us, but it's not going to be at the typical time of Thursday at 4.30. Next month we're actually having it Thursday uh, the, the 19th, so it's not going to be the last Thursday of the month, it's the third <coughs> Thursday of the month. And that one's actually on carceral livelihoods in Puerto Rico and we have the purple flyer available here so you can learn a little bit more about it. And this is the red flyer for our briefing that's happening the week before. So we hope you can join us. And lastly, before um, I go any further, we're also trying to bring together researchers with lived experience of drug use who want to kind of talk about what that means to be a drug researcher who feels, um, who has lived experience. And so if you identify as such, if you are a student who identifies as such and you want to kind of talk about what that means for your research, think through what that might mean for the movement more broadly in terms of researchers opening up about their identities and lived experience, please contact us. We'd love for you to join it. We lovingly call it NERDL, um, the Network of Drug Researchers with Lived Experience. Um, and anyway, so before we get started, I also just want to um, recognize that some of us might have a lot of questions today before we get started. And so I urge you all, if you have a question that you must absolutely ask in the exact moment, if there's an acronym you don't understand, if she speaks too fast and mispronounces something, or if you don't get what she said, raise your hand and wait for her to call upon you if you want some clarity. But if you have a substantive topic-related question, I ask you to please hold them until the end of the talk so that we can all make sure to get through the content of the presentation. And we'll, we'll get through that a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to give it to Summer so she can introduce our speaker. Great. Hi, everyone. 
So this is Dr. Naomi Zodi. She is an assistant professor of health economics at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Policy, as well as a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship in social work at Columbia University um, and is formerly a fellow at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I'm a social work student as well, so nice to hear. Her research focuses on the consequences and the remedies of social and economic inequality, especially in healthcare and in insurance. Um, she's also done really interesting research around universal baby bonds as a way to close the white-black uh, uh, racial wealth gap, which I think is really interesting. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us, and please welcome Thank her. you so much. I am really excited to talk to this particular group and you know it's something like you know when I'm working in social work it's a really nice opportunity to do research in the interest of people you know where sometimes in economics it feels like we're doing research in the interest of markets and whoever those markets are like they're not people <laughs> so first I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my research about the social implications of Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion has been an important kind of insight into the importance of public health care coverage, which is something that we're kind of on a larger scale debating uh, in our public discussion right now. And then kind of intersections with that and drug research, and finally just like what we can do and what are the social structures that we have to examine. So it turns out that Medicaid expansion, it's about a lot more than health care which is not immediately obvious. You know, it's possible that Medicaid just provides health care. Maybe a person um, would not have otherwise gotten that cancer screening, but now they get Medicaid and they do. Um, but then there's also the possibility, let's say a person who has like an ongoing chronic health care need, diabetes or um, hypertension, something like that, they have to come out of their pocket every month for their treatment, and now they get Medicaid and that's gone. It could free up money for other necessities. So we just had the question, does it impact the rate of poverty in the US, um, taking into account out-of-pocket medical expenditures and like the net resources that a household has to meet their basic needs? So under the ACA, just to primer what Medicaid expansion did prior to the ACA's expansion of Medicaid, it provided public health care coverage for people below a certain level of income, like 16000 a year for a single adult, but only if they fell under these certain kinds of categories. So you had to be over the age of 65, a child or a, a pregnant woman. Um, and then under Medicaid expansion, it's just all adults, regardless of their income. For children, actually, the income level is higher. But at least for adults, it raises the floor regardless of your different kinds of characteristics. If your income is below a certain amount, you would get covered. So um, the way that we want to assess the implications of Medicaid expansion for poverty is by, uh, it's actually an important feature of the Medicaid expansion for research, not so much for people's lives, but for research, the fact that not all states expanded Medicaid. Some did, some didn't. Some did it early, some did it late. So the way that we assess the importance of Medicaid expansion is by testing for each state their pre and post level. And that happened in different years in different places, so we can kind of net out whatever was the um, trend, you know, the macro trends, maybe unemployment happened in this time or whatever it is. You can kind of take all of that away and just say on average, what is the pre post impact of the policy? So this information that's continuing to come out about the importance of Medicaid expansion is being used in a lot of states who have still yet to expand Medicaid, um, and other states who are considering restricting Medicaid coverage through what they call like work requirements, but what's really it's about proving work, which is an immense administrative burden for a lot of people, and even people who meet the work requirements. Um, Arkansas, for example, I think it's in the Supreme Court and they've kind of held it up, or it's in the courts anyway, because a lot of people meet these work requirements, but they just, were unable, it was something like 75% of people just never even went to the website. Um, it's effective at diminishing Medicaid, um, but little else, right? So as states are thinking about, should we expand, should we constrict, you know, all of this information is continuing to be, to play a role in that. So anyway, we find that yes, Medicaid expansion reduced the rate of poverty in the United States. And, you know, we do this whole like rigorous, Thing, right? 
Um, and we find that on average, per year, that means 700,000 people avoid poverty because of the expansion of Medicaid. And it's not just rates of poverty. We also find the same effect for rates of home evictions in the United States. So we did that whole rigorous thing, but just looking visually at what is happening, um, this line is the states that expand Medicaid, and around the year when most of the Medicaid expansions happened, which is 2014, it just drops off. Some of the early states started around 2012, California, stuff. But so as a rate of um, per 1,000 renter-occupied households, the rate of home evictions, it's just a significant reduction because people who are near the margins have extra money. So what does this mean for people who use drugs. I mean, housing instability is a really important outcome for this population. There was a study of um, people who use needle exchanges in the city of Philadelphia, and it's like, you know, some 78% of this population experiences housing instability. Um, housing instability among people who use drugs is also associated with use of, like, public drug use over, overdose experiences and also witnessing another person's overdose. And it's not even so much necessarily that Medicaid expansion means that this population will now have stable housing, but it can introduce a kind of economic um, stability within their networks, within people that they know, you know, their extended family members and also kids um, who might be future users of drugs. It, it introduces stability into these communities. Um, and, and poverty and housing instability can be an important source of trauma, especially when experienced as a child for their late life outcomes. Um, I think an interesting finding is that they find an association, even in, it's, a, it's a rigorous study, but they find an association between assembly plant closures and future opioid deaths. So introducing stability can have just like so many important implications for the social environment that these drug phenomena are playing out in. You know, but more than that, also Medicaid expansion directly impacts people who have, um, you know, drug use disorders. So they also find that expansion states, using this similar kind of methodology, that expansion states show a re um, an increase in the per capita rate of buprenorphine or opioid replacement therapy prescriptions, and no change in the rate of opioid prescriptions per capita. Um, and that was especially true in states that empower physicians to prescribe um, these replacement therapies, so that, like, have less prior authorization requirements. So I want to talk a little bit more about prior authorization requirements, because I think it's an interesting window into the social structures that are happening here. So prior authorization, it's basically an insurance company tool for limiting the consumption of healthcare. When you use healthcare, your insurance company loses money. So it's one of their cost savings tools. And it's not just something that they apply to the prescription of opioids, but also to things like replacement therapies and rehabilitative services. But the thing is that, so the prior authorization, you know, your doctor writes your prescription and then it has to go through a process through the insurance company, it can take 24 to 48 hours maybe until you're able to fill the prescription. So that could be a really critical period of time for a person who is seeking replacement therapy. Um, and yet, you know, this practice is able to, to play out even in the year 2020 when we are dealing with the opioid crisis and have been for a while, right? So in just even by 2005, there is a huge increase in um, the rate of prescription of opioids. And by 2009, we are seeing like really substantial increases in overdoses and deaths due to opioids. And so this graph, it's from Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, it's the CDC publication. And it shows that Blue Cross Blue Shield, the insurance company, implemented a voluntary uh, prior authorization. So again, it's prior authorization, one of their cost savings tools. So they imposed that on the prescription of opioids in the year 2012, and they find a significant reduction in, um, you know, I mean, it's not like 
that dramatic, but it is a reduction in the rate of opioid prescription fills. It's kind of amazing that we can go from this picture in the year of 2009 where we see like this really expansive increase in, in opioid overdose and deaths, and in 2012, kind of the beginning of some ways of addressing it. Um, when at the same time, we have still a lot of states that, are, uh, that have laws that impose prior authorization on the fill of buprenorphine and methadone and replacement therapies, right? So this is a letter from April 2019 with a bunch of states like pleading with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, to lift some of these um, restrictions on filling prescriptions for buprenorphine. So, you know, we have these current requirements to obtain a waiver to prescribe it, and it places limits on the medical community's ability to respond. Um, and the need for buprenorphine is growing exponentially, uh, but the supply of waivers is not, even though we know that buprenorphine can act, you know, is highly effective in preventing morbidity and mortality. So how is it possible that we have that the, on the one hand, and um, prior authorizations for replacement therapies, um, and also no prior authorization for opioids? How can those two, two things coexist in one healthcare system? Um, well, let's talk about it. <laughs> so we just kind of leave markets to do what they will. Um, and it doesn't necessarily require a really evil person to dream these things up. It just requires a lot of people working in their interests and not thinking about how it fits into the larger picture, that we can come out with such a system as what we have today. So we usually tend to treat medical care like it's a competitive market, but there are a lot of reasons why it's not. Um, physician licensure, it's just really hard to get into medical school. They also limit like foreign medical entrance because they can constrain the supply of physicians and increase the price of physicians as their services. It, it, so it's so there are some restrictions in how competitive it can be. You think about like a perfectly competitive market. I think the perfect example of that is nail salons. There's a million of them. They're everywhere. They all do pretty much the same thing. And if one is so much better than the other, we'll go there. Or if one is a lot cheaper, we'll go there. They kind of have to compete for us. But in healthcare, there's little room for any pressure, competitive pressure on prices. So as consumers, if you're having a heart attack, you'll go to the nearest hospital. You know? Also, your physician, you don't know what you need. Your doctor does. So you kind of just do whatever they tell you to do. So we're not really price shopping. We're not really empowered to. But it's also just kind of doesn't really, um, it's not really relevant to the experience of consuming medical care. So it's not exactly a competitive market, but we still like to leave it alone. And when we say, when I say we like to leave it alone, uh, we do have a lot of public intervention on behalf of the suppliers of medical care. Um, you know, the ACA, a lot of what the ACA did was to cr establish and protect the private market for health insurance outside of the employer market, but the non-group market, it created that. And the portal, you know, you go to healthcare.gov and you can shop for these different plans. So um, we do a lot of intervention on behalf of creating and sustaining markets, um, the way that we enforce physician licensure and monopolies. But when we usually, when we think about the phrase government intervention and the negative connotations with that, it's when we try to intervene on behalf of consumers that it kind of, it kind of becomes a problem. Now, why would that be? I think. You know, again, it's not because anybody here is evil, okay? <laughs> but because people who have a lot of power and wealth um, are just the center of gravity. You know, they're able to hire the best and the brightest and pay them the most to solve their problems. Um, but we don't necessarily have the same infrastructure around the issues that affect the people who are vulnerable to their decisions. So the Zachlis family, they own, they've pled guilty to a lot of um, misleading regulators about opioids. Um, they've made a lot, a lot of money off of the outcomes that we're seeing today. So just to give you a sense, when we talk about wealth inequality and, you know, wealth begets a lot of power, so just how unequal it is, 
um, sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around. But let's take 100 people to represent the United States and $100 to represent its wealth. Uh, one thing that we could do would be to give every person $1, right? That would be perfectly equal. That is not what we do. Um, the first thing we do is we give $40 to the first person. Okay, and then we give another $40 to the next nine people. And then we give, we spread $20 amongst the other 90 of us. And in reality, it's the last few owe the first few. So this is how we kind of distribute wealth and power today. And it's not just that it's super concentrated, it's that it's growing increasingly concentrated over time. So you can see like in the 80s, what's happening is that there's the introduction of um, computers and there's a lot of efficiency that's created through that process, but it's not necessarily the individual employee that benefited from the efficiency created by computers, as much as it is whoever it was that had put up the capital for the organization in the first place that tended to reap the rewards. So over the past several decades, we've had a bunch of uh, growth <coughs> and efficiency created, but it has primarily gone into um, creating wealth for the top percentile of the country, which really takes off in kind of an amazing way. So again, it's not that they have to be evil, it's just that they're the center of gravity. Amartya Sen, he's like one of my favorite people, who is, uh, he won a Nobel Prize in economics, but now he's kind of a philosopher. And he just writes that, you know, when um, you look at the sun and the moon from the earth, they seem to be the same size, even though the sun is literally 400 times the size of the moon. But they look the same size from here. That's why a, an eclipse is possible. But what happens is the moon is just closer to you than the sun. So they appear to be the same size. So even something that looks objective you can't get over the fact that whatever is closer to you is going to appear more prominent. So you solve the problems around you and you have so much power. You solve those problems, everything else kind of can atrophy in society. So when we have the median dollar of wealth is at about the nine, between the 97th and 98th percentile of the population. So half of all the power is amongst 2%. They solve their problems and then they give us some, right? <laughs> So this is kind of the social economic structure we're facing. What kinds of solutions might we be able to propose? Um, one idea that's out there that has a lot of popularity politically right now is like a Medicare for all versus a public option. So I think that the idea of having like a single payer tax financed healthcare system is that you decide um, what the distribution of spending will be. So you can decide to finance healthcare as a percentage of household income, and you, you know, can plan out what percentage of household income a person should spend, and then you collect money in that whatever uh, you know, dis distribution that you have decided upon. So that's an idea. Um, yeah, again, I think it's an interesting idea. <laughs> Um, another idea that's out there that I've done some research on is baby bonds. So baby bonds, it's Adira Hamilton's idea, but I did a, some of the empirical analysis, like what would happen if we were to do it. So baby bonds, it's basically just universal trust funds, uh, but publicly funded. So the federal government gives every newborn baby some money and it can grow until they become an adult and then they get to have them have it. They get control over it as an adult, it's like a seed capital. It's a trust fund. Um, and you would do it like inversely related to household wealth. So the wealthiest families will get maybe 500 and the least wealthy would get like 50,000. Could that actually make any progress in wealth inequality? That was the question. Um, and okay, so today the black white wealth inequality is pretty extreme. This is just among young adult households. So actually older adults have more of an extreme disparity in wealth. They haven't had a chance yet to like accumulate that much money. But looking at just young adult households of kind of today's cohort, um, had we had <coughs> universal trust funds when they were born in the late 80s, early 90s, what would happen, right? So today young white adults have like 16 times the wealth of young black adults. 
But with baby bonds, which by the way, I didn't mention, but it would only cost about 80 billion. So it's like 10% of social security or about as much as SNAP. Food stamps are about 73 billion. So we had that, right? So we have this inequality in wealth among young adults. If we, if we implemented baby bonds, um, we could actually reduce it pretty substantially, like from a factor of 16 at the median to a factor of 1.4. It's like almost eliminating the median racial wealth disparity. So I think that the point is that there, there are really big structural issues and we can impose really big structural solutions. Um, and these are my principles for what kind of progress we should make. They should be anti-racist. You have to keep in mind whatever is the legacy of inequality that exists. So with baby bonds, we did it, uh, it, it it's as a basis of wealth rather than income because we know that wealth is much more extremely racially disparate even than income because it's an intergenerational um, phenomenon. Like wealth, you inherit wealth. You know, your parents have a lot more to do with your wealth than your income actually. So, so that's what I mean by anti-racist, understanding how our policies interact with whatever racist stuff has already been happening and designing it in a way that maximizes the benefit for historically disadvantaged groups. Anti-racist, universal. Um, I was on a call with some activists for the New York Health Act. It's like single payer for the state of New York. And at the end of the call, their rallying cry was, everybody in, nobody out, which I really like. I think universal programs, they're usually funded in a progressive manner. Uh, so they're still redistributive, but it just removes the burden of proof. So anti-racist, universal, structural reform. So these are my principles of progress, but I would encourage everyone to think about their own. Um, dream big, you know, even bigger, whatever it is you were thinking, dream bigger. And um, I think that it's like a really opportune moment for us to do that. And I would um, love to hear more about the kinds of policies that, that we might be able to see for people who use drugs, uh, people who have drug use disorders, and everybody else. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Naomi, for that presentation. Um, I know Aliza is tracking folks who are at home. So before we invite folks in the room, is there anyone at home who has called in um, or who is online who has a question, feel free to raise your hand in Zoom and we will make sure to get to you. But I'm going to start with folks in the room if no one else has raised their hand. No? Okay. Um, so uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So great. Thank you. Uh, I got a, a bunch, but I'll, I'll start with one um, right now. So. Going back to the, um, the single payer mm -hmm. versus public option, um, you know that's obviously a huge uh, yep. debate question that you know the Democratic primary is is uh, uh, dealing with. Yeah. Um, and maybe you know you're you're more of an expert in this than I am. Can you explain how um, or talk about how they would happen at the same time? Because the way I think about it is like. You have someone like Bloomberg or whomever is like, you know, keep your health care if you really like it, and then we'll also have this public option. But over time, if more people are going to kind of the universal health care plan, wouldn't then the insurance companies like raise your premiums and make the one that you really like kind of shitty? Excuse me, I don't know if that's hard. Yeah. Uh, make kind of crappy. Um, so can you maybe explain how those those different things maybe compete or don't compete or yeah I've actually spent a lot of my day today writing a paper called is the public option a smokescreen <laughs> and okay I mean the problem is that pro like insurance markets are kind of fragile so if you offer and also that consumers are highly price sensitive so if there is just like an offer of a very low cost but still high quality health insurance coverage like most people are going to migrate to that option. And the private insurance market, I mean, some people might say who just like to have expensive health care, but it's going to be very difficult to maintain a private market, which means that whoever is implementing this private, this public option is going to have to weigh that. It can't make it too good if they want to have a viable, functional private market alongside their public option. So they're actually going to be put in the position of pitting their our interests 
against the private market's interests and just like, well, how good can we make it without it being too good? You know, that's the best outcome I think that we could have for a public option. There are some states who are starting to have public option legislation. The state of Washington was the first one that actually um, passed one into law. And there was a lot of debate, if you read like the newspaper articles around it, there was a lot of debate around, you know, they were going to make it like a Medicaid buy-in, so it would be um, really low rates to physicians, a narrow network. Um, but there was a lot of pushback on that. And then um, I think what they ended up with was like 175% of Medicare rates, which is like, you know, Medicare has a pretty good sized network. I don't know. I mean, basically, it, it, minimal cost savings because they just had to do it that way. Yeah. But, but New York has an expanded program because there is Medicaid, which is very generous, so I guess. Yeah, the basic health plan. New York, and then there's the state of health where for 10 or $20, depending on if you make too much for Medicaid based on, I don't know if it's 138% or. Yeah, or yeah. It's paired on this than I am, but you can get in and otherwise then you're, and then you're on a sub, basically you're on a subsidy market. But I have a question for your. Just quick question though, Kelly, yeah. do you feel like your question was answered? But yeah, yes, okay. I, I appreciate it. All and, right, uh, okay. Yeah, and then like a separate, can you go back to the, the letter? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so the letter, so as a addiction doc who has a data 275, so this is like fantastic, I don't know if you're also on the long sure. list, it's just what yeah. you see here, but the waiver, when you're mentioning about the market of clinicians, so we do have a very broad market because nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants who can also get mm -hmm. data waivers, I know you didn't mention in this thing, but I should say that holistically all these clinicians can and I work with clinicians of all degrees that can, right, I do agree about potentially removing the whole waiver thing because it's just a burden. But here in New York, actually I was at a meeting the other week, the NYSA meeting, and they were saying that there are trained so many clinicians of all stripes here in New York City, so there's a large um, uh, volume of clinicians with X numbered availabilities, but very few are actually prescribing which is a thing they find, especially in rural communities like Eastern Kentucky. They did somebody did a study in the newspaper I read. They called a whole bunch of docs that had the X waiver. Only so many saw. Only so many had capacity. So it's, yeah, I think the market is just to expand on what you mentioned there, which is really great. But yeah, that, there's a lot more market dynamic than just doctors only writing that. It's, it's a complex it's thing. It is how much variation there is between different states, also in terms of what like so-called mid-level providers are like empowered to do. So in some states, nurse practitioners and physician assistants can't write prescriptions unless like the doctor is like around. Others, they can, they have, I think in New York State, they're fairly good about a lot of these laws. You know, New York State outlawed private insurance, uh, privately owned hospitals, you know, they only have nonprofits. There are no for-profit, I meant, no sorry. For-profit is what I meant. Yeah. They have no for-profit hospitals in the state of New York, whereas like a lot of other states they do. Um, but we have certificate of need laws and things like that. Yeah, but so, but anyway, so there's like a lot of variation between states in terms of like what different people are allowed to do. I don't think that the state of New York is um, signed on to this, but even California. So, um, yeah, I don't know the, what the, apparently it is an issue for like a bunch of states, so. <laughs> Yeah, but I think that there is a lot of variation, and that's why kind of like federal law is usually something that just like brings everybody to the same level playing field or like to a floor. And then beyond that, states can kind of like um, improvise or innovate or like try new things to make it even better. But despite like having, like knowing for a fact that buprenorphine is really positive, there are still a lot of states that have these prior authorizations for Medicaid um, physicians. And the federal government hasn't really done anything about it, at least as of 2019, April. Any other questions? I was just thinking, as you were talking about a lot of the variation from state to state, it makes me think about just the, how the term like state rights has been used and what that looks like just in terms of lots of different policies, right? Like often state rights mean that it's means that it's very different. And for me, when I think about state, state rights, I think about it as kind of a dog whistle for like, mm -hmm. you can go ahead and do whatever you would like. 
Um, and it's kind of interesting to be living in this time now where it feels a little bit flip flopped where it's like the federal government I feel very distrustful of and I'm like really hoping that like New York State can um, be a better provider for people. But I, I just think that what yeah, you talk about that, you know, is um, states don't have rights, people do. Mm -hmm. And we might have a right for Medicaid physicians to write prescriptions. So it might be the federal government's job in that instance to protect that right. You know, different like levels of government might have jurisdiction or different kinds of capacities to step in and protect our human rights. But those are kind of the only ones that exist. People also say something like data wants to be free. Like data doesn't want anything. People want things, you know, people want to be free. But it, it's a good way to like avoid, I think, like the human implications of, of policy. Yeah. Um, on that is, you know, Ford has been in the state of New York for 30 years for state regulatory agencies. And one of the problems he's putting around the country, I see this more and more now working as a consultant post retirement, is that the variation between governance and regulation of uh, substance use disorder treatment around the country is very, very, very. New York State is actually far ahead. You know, New York State, for instance, mandated all uh, treatment providers to make MAT available. But many states though, still don't do that. It's also the issue of you know some of the rapacious practices that happen in places like, particularly Florida. Uh, there's government contract <coughs> with uh, private rehab and sober homes in California, and so that. Right. So one of the big problems here is that federal government really SAMHSA and CSAT have set up certain level of standards, but really from the enforcement being left to the states and incredibly variable. And the problem with New York State is that well, as much as we try to, you know, hold a relatively high, not perfect by any means, but relatively high standard, we're constantly undermined by uh, predatory marketing coming in from other states of providers who are very unregulated. And it creates really real problems in the market, so to speak, because you know, folks are coming in and also appealing to uh, the beliefs of parents that somehow, you know, that uh, going out of state to these, you know, quote unquote fancy rehabs for those couples in many cases was desirable and so forth. Huh. So there's a real problem that the federal government hasn't set standards much higher for the states in terms of how they regulate this market. Because people in New York State are vulnerable to yes. the rehab of Florida. Right. Yeah, we've done some things to stop uh, what they call patient brokering. Yeah, I heard about this in New Yorker. But uh, it's still a little bit problem. So I have two questions. Can you send us that paper when it's out, the yeah. smoke screen paper? Because yeah. I'm sure that a lot of people in the room would like to read it. But about the baby bonds, has anyone done any sort of like municipal or small scale uh, actual implementation study? Or has there actually, like, it, it seems like a great conceptual exercise and you kind of extrapolated, you know, with the assumptions. But has anyone ever tried it? So they, there is, and it's actually kind of starting to take off a lot more right now, but on a much smaller scale. So they might give you like $1,500, which I'm sure will be useful once you become a young adult, but it's not exactly the same thing as like, as like $20,000 or $50,000 uh, in terms of like what kinds of impacts it can have for a person's life. Um, so like Oakland is doing it right now, Oklahoma, um, Singapore, Israel, uh, yeah, it's kind of taking off, but definitely at a much smaller scale. And can I just ask a quick follow-up? So the state would just give someone that at birth? Okay. Yeah, the way they, 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 Michigan too. Well, it depends, like different places, but in a lot of places, what they're doing is that it is, um, it's automatic. It's based on your social security number. Technically, the state owns it, but you are the primary beneficiary of the account, and you're the only one legally allowed to do anything with it. That way, you don't have to show up to a bank somebody else started the account for you. And then they just like tell people about it. In Michigan, they've been doing this for a while and they've been interviewing the parents, like now the kids are in middle school or something and the parents like remember this and they show that they have like higher um, communication about the child's future relative to like similarly situated parents in other towns or states. And, um, and there's like all these different kinds of implications. Not so it might be more important than the money, even though the money is small and won't do what this is. It has other, you know, impacts. Any other questions? I can ask another one. Then. So you said dream bigger, and you just, and you talked about anti-racist kind of principles. 
and uh, you talked about inheritance. Uh, so would you be an advocate for um, a policy that got rid of inheritance? Well, I think we should probably tax it. Uh, in George W. Bush, there was a big um, push against the inheritance tax, and they called it the death tax. And even though that tax was only applied to estates in excess, or even, like the amount of the estate in excess of like five and ten million dollars, so like the first five and ten million you can just have, and then the next everything above that, which is very few people would be affected by it. But they had this great marketing campaign calling it a death tax, and we just repealed it, you know, and we felt so strongly about it. And so, you know, I mean, like, that kind of creates like um, aristocracy, you know, inherited aristocracy that um, uh, it's hard to argue in favor of, really. Um, so it's not that they shouldn't have the right to the ownership of the property, but we should probably tax it. Because like, also they, they made that money through other people's labor, most likely. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. So, Thank you, by the way. Um, when you brought up the prior authorization, I think it's great that you included that too. I was wondering, you know, I know a couple, at least New Jersey has recently passed legislation to remove prior authorizations for MAT. <coughs> it's what you talked about. It's kind of crazy how long it's taking, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was just curious what your opinions were. There's been, at least from my, where I'm sitting, sort of a hyper focus on prior authorizations or you oh, really? other or as the insurance barrier other than co-payments and premiums, which I think people understand, but this other thing of prior authorization. Are you aware of other insurance tools? Mechanisms. Tools for cost? Yeah, yeah, for cost. The ACA did a really good job of like, you know, instituting parity that the, you have to cover substance use and mental health the same way as any other kind of medical care. Um, and they were pretty imposed pretty broadly. I don't know. I mean, that happened in 2010. I don't remember this conversation happening about, like, in relation to opioids, but it turned out to be really important. Um, I mean, just healthcare in general is so insanely expensive. And the cost of healthcare is increasing so much faster than household wages. Uh, like, median wage is pretty much stagnant uh, for since, like, the 80s or so. And yet the cost of health care is, you know, an increasing percentage of GDP every year. Like right now it's around 18 percent. Um, and like in 2012, it was, I want to say like 16 percent, you know, and GDP is 13 trillion. So every percentage point of GDP is really substantial. Uh, but I mean, I think it's just the fact that health care is so insanely expensive. That's going to be like a major deterrent for a lot of people. Um, I don't know as much about what kinds of barriers people have. like specifically with respect to the way that they access replacement therapy. Um, so I know that so recently Governor Cuomo removed prior authorization for MAT for people with commercial insurance, but not for people with Medicaid. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak to disparities between commercial insurance and Medicaid and maybe how those disparities are reliably has shifted under Medicaid expansion. Yeah, um, that's insane that they would do that. I know the states do they already have? Do you use the excuse of the fact that Medicaid uh, prescribed or Medicaid enrollees would only have one choice? So he made the choice argument that in removing the prior authorization, it would have to do with limited choices. Yeah. And it has to do with the fight with the manufacturer. Yeah, with the manufacturer of the drug. One manufacturer that somebody told me about. Mm -hmm. that that's why that happened. There's actually yeah. an underlying reason why that. The, the government didn't pass it because I agree that it should have been passed. But it's in the well, interest it's anyway of suppliers. Yeah. 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 And that's what he used. They cut yeah. some cost thing with one man. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. But yeah. regardless of it, that, that's the thing. It's just small. Um, it's a small yeah. Barrier. Yeah. Much less than people's actual lives. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and then what was your question? What, what's the relationship that you see between commercial insurance and people and folks on Medicaid, and how is that relationship shifted under the expansion of Medicaid? So it's interesting, like Medicaid, like people who have Medicaid coverage, it's a minority of physicians that tend to treat them. So whenever you had Medicaid expansion, and I don't know specifically about the case of New York, but I know nationally that um, under Medicaid expansion, there wasn't an increase in like the number of physicians willing to accept Medicaid patients. But we 
also see that the medical system pretty much absorbed them. So what happens is the same exact number of clinics and doctors are just seeing more patients now. So maybe they have like Saturdays now, or they're staying later, or maybe they're seeing each person for a shorter amount of time. Um, but it's like they're able to absorb it, but there's not anymore. So somehow they're squeezing them into the same infrastructure. So I think that it's like there's a, it's like a rubber band or something. We're like pulling it very tight in terms of like it's putting strain on safety net providers um, and that kind of under, because they underpay for that care. So it's like the safety net relative to private insurance or even Medicare. So the safety net providers are just like relatively increasingly overburdened um, and have like maybe less time to do care coordination activities. And you might be able to speak to this, but... Um, Actually, New York is very robust with Medicaid with currently, despite this legal thing, that I write a lot of buprenorphine, all the generic will Suboxone, which is the name brand, and then there's other name brands, but that being the cheap one, on every Medicaid managed care plan and straight Medicaid from the state, you can get buprenorphine in some way, shape, or form, tablet film, name brand film, actually straight Medicaid only covers the name brand of Suboxone. Um, Vivitrol, the injected naltrexone, is universally covered and is very easy and I never have a final question. I usually think of the person's insurance is not active within the Medicaid system, which is another bureaucracy that hinders it, but otherwise it's actually very, very accessible around here to get it. And lots and lots of practitioners. Well, I think that some of the, um, you know, issue with just like having a safety net program as opposed to like a more universal program is when we have that phenomenon of increasingly overburden or overstressed, like just the fact that any providers are considered just the safety net providers and because they play the safety net provider role, they're going to have less resources for their practice. Um, is kind of like a issue that's inherent within the concept of Medicaid as they, um, they have, there's a saying that like there are, um, Programs for the poor are poor programs, as opposed to like universal programs, because we're all universally invested in them or whatever. So that kind of like didn't stop being true under Medicaid expansion. I have a question. Did you have a question? I know that you went through the eviction findings pretty quickly, because I know that you had a lot to cover. But I was wondering if you could go back to the Medicaid expansion and eviction studies that you were talking about, and maybe tell us a little bit more about some of the other findings that you had, or some other kind of key points now that we have a little bit of space for you to talk about it, because I do appreciate yeah. that you wanted to get yeah, through. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and there are a lot of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, we, we got these data. So actually, so there were two papers that we wrote. The first one, we bought a bunch of data from like this company. I don't know, I felt really weird about it, but it's like a company, they're an aggregator for, the, it's like a subscription service that landlords pay into, I guess, every month. And then whenever they're about to rent out an apartment, they can look your name up and see if you've ever been evicted. So we, yeah, we went in. Yeah, that's like, it's like the infrastructure of blacklisting. So we went in on the back end and just like took all of the data and just, because it has like addresses and dates of these court filings. Even that is actually public records. You can, they're public like county court records that they've gone in and aggregated for like every county for many years. So we just, we have, you know, your address at the time and when this is happening. So we looked at both completed evictions and also just initiations, like court filing initiations. And after we even control for um, all these county level characteristics, because, you know, evictions are um, more likely in co counties that are like higher percent black. So if it's like more than 50% black, then there's like a really high rate of home eviction, um, even after, you know, you control for also like rent burden. So just what is the median level of rent as a proportion of median area income? Um, so you can control for all of these things and because we were afraid that maybe some of this is like related to gentrification or something, but so we just looked at it in a bunch of different ways. But basically that the bottom line is that it was this effect was we are finding it in many different kinds of communities in rural, in urban, like higher rent burden neighborhoods, in places that are higher percent black. Um, Medicaid expansion seemed to like pretty universally have like a significant reduction in the rates of home eviction and in the rates of uh, court initiation. Actually, okay, so what we found was that 
the rate of initiations in court stayed the same, but they were less likely to then be, um, they were more likely to be dismissed. So once you get there, you're like, well, I can put it, I can like make a payment plan, and then you actually were better able to follow through on that payment plan. So as a result, there was like less um, completed eviction. I'm thinking so much coming up the data from all these different angles is really, really interesting. Um, I'm interested in what kind of possibilities you might see for state, uh, for any type of public option that um, makes specific services or tailored services towards uh, populations like people who use drugs. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I think that the, the part of the problem with the phrase public option is that it's very vague and it could be really like, it could have so many different kinds of um, costs associated, like do you pay for a whole premium, like are you really just paying in the amount that you're expecting to get out? Because I would imagine that people who use drugs might have a lot of complex healthcare needs, uh, and so buying into that insurance pool could become very expensive, perhaps prohibitively expensive for the population that we're trying to address. Um, so maybe it could be like subsidized, publicly subsidized, um, but that then it's also, um, you know, to what extent would that be different from just having public health care coverage? Uh, I'm not sure. Also, it's there's like it's a wide open area. If anybody has a great idea about how to structure a public option, I haven't thought of. Um, the, the fact is that we kind of use this phrase a lot, but nobody has really decided what it means. I, I think that's part of the plan, but you know. Any other questions? From anyone who hasn't asked a question yet, someone new. Can you just sit down? Anybody online? Uh, well, great. Thanks, you, everybody. Yeah, and we'll still be here for a little bit. If you do have questions, um, please uh, come up and, and ask them. And uh, your contact information is also, I think, available in the email that we sent out. So thank you all so much for coming, and we'll see you next month.